He is risen. I can hear many of you responding. He is risen indeed. Greetings, folks, and welcome to our Easter sermon. My name is Glenn, and I want to start today by playing a little game of Who Am I? Here are some clues. Try and guess who we're talking about. I was a contemporary of Jesus, like when he was in human form on the earth. In fact, I was one of his disciples, like one of the 12 disciples. I have no books named after me in the Bible, nor did I write any. I was the one who found the lad with the five loaves and two fish. Speaking of fish, I was a fisherman before meeting Jesus. My brother was also a disciple and much better known than me. Any ideas who I am? I am Andrew, brother of Peter, disciple of Jesus. I'm only mentioned 12 times in the New Testament, four of those being lists of disciples. Very little is known about me. No letters to churches, no long missionary journeys mentioned, no speeches before kings or emperors. In fact, very little is known about many of the 12 disciples. And yet, they must have had ministries. What do you think they did? I bet some of them stayed in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, helping out the churches and new leaders. Some might have gone back to their hometowns to spread the good news. Some must have supported Peter and Paul behind the scenes in their much more public ministries. The point is that no distinction is ever made between what each disciple did or didn't do, other than Judas. All were needed to help establish the kingdom. It is no different today. Few of us will be known beyond our own congregation, but we are all still needed. When I was growing up, my dad was in the Messengers Quartet, a full-time gospel singing group in the 1960s and 70s. This was a very new kind of ministry at the time, and they did a lot of traveling and became quite well known, at least in Christian circles. When I would meet people at various churches or events, I would usually introduce myself by saying that they might know my dad, a block from the messengers, and more often than not, they did. I have not had that kind of exposure, influence, or recognition, but ministries in the churches I've been a part of are just as necessary and important. The same goes for each of you. Some of you will have a larger influence and reach as you use your spiritual gifts, but most of you will have a much smaller circle. Do not for a minute think you are less valuable or that your ministry is not really needed. We need everyone, and everyone has a part to play. It all started at Easter, and we know that the disciples had no idea how far the kingdom they were helping to establish would reach. <laughs> Neither do we. Don't let discouragement, weariness, or difficulties keep you from participating. Get involved and see what God will do. Let's pray. God, we know you didn't send your son Jesus to die only so we could get to heaven. You want us to be your ambassadors, your messengers of reconciliation to the world. Some of us will have big and visible roles in doing that, but many more of us will have smaller roles but not less important. Show us where we need to be involved. Show us what our gifts are and then motivate us to do what you've called us to do. Most importantly, Lord, remind us that our first ministry is to our own relationship with Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. Now let's listen to the kids as they share with us the Easter story. Hey guys, the Easter story is amazing. Yeah, I especially love the ending. Do you want to tell the story? Yeah, but we might want some help from our friends too. It goes like this. Zeus Yump was a happy place. A call day called Passover. Jesus came by donkey transport. Hosanna was the password. Palm branches were everywhere. People called him king. But days later, nothing was the same. From grand entrance to final meal. From the mount to the garden. 
This was 37 coins Jesus was a trade. The high priest and the governor interrogated Jesus. The evidence wasn't too legit. The whole thing was big. Even the crowd turned. They chanted, crucify him. Jesus was stripped, whipped, and tortured. Je Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Ouch, that had to hurt. When they hung him on a cross, it wasn't a pretty sight. Jesus cried, it is finished, and breathed his last breath. They laid him in a tomb. And he see a big rock. After the Sabbath, the woman went to go see the tomb. Nothing had prepared them for the surprise that awaited them. That tomb is empty. The angel said to the woman, don't be afraid, he is not here. He is risen, suck it out for yourself. Go tell everybody that great news. It's still good news today. The tomb is empty and Jesus still lived. That's the only hope for you and me. This crazy world is it we live in. It's not complicated, really. We have a Savior, Jesus Messiah. He died for us. He rose for us. He lives for us. So we worship him. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. Forgiven, redeemed, this is amazing grace. And that is what Easter is all about. Go tell everyone this great news. That tomb is still so empty. empty. Christ, Christ is risen from the dead. Trampoline over death by death. <laughs> come awake, come, come awake. Come, come and rise up from the grave. grave. Thank you, kids. He is risen. I just want to do a brief uh, recap of Good Friday. One of the things Jesus said, it, it's in John 12, 32. He said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. At first, it seems that Jesus is talking about his coming entrance into heaven. But the following verse explains that Jesus is referring to his crucifixion. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die, risen up on a cross. As evening approached, a disciple named Joseph asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, and he took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own tomb. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. The next day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate and said, We remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. The first being that he said he was the son of God. So take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard, eight soldiers. It was Friday. Jesus has been crucified and his body put in a tomb. And so we waited. But now we come to the first day of the week, reading from Luke chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that seemed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. Jesus is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words, kind of putting the dots together. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven apostles and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because the words seemed to them like nonsense. Resurrection? Peter, however, he got up and he ran to the tomb. 
Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what had happened? What had happened? The crucifixion of Jesus. He was the only one who had words of eternal life, and he was now dead. And now there's a claim of an empty tomb. What has happened? Three important truths come from the death and resurrection of Jesus. There are more than that, but today I want to cover three. Number one, with the death and resurrection of Jesus. The ceremonial law was abolished. Romans 10.4 puts it this way, Christ is the end of the law. The law finds its completion and fulfillment in Jesus. Therefore, all the Old Testament rules concerning animal sacrifices are set aside, and the rules and regulations concerning the priesthood are out of date, since the greater priest, Jesus, has now laid down his life for his people. All of these laws pointed to the cross, but once Jesus died, they are no longer needed. The mosaic economy is dissolved to make way for a better hope. We are cleansed once and for all. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect those who are being made holy. He has made believers perfect, and yet we are on our way to perfection. This is the great hope of the resurrection. Number two. The price of sin was paid in full. Do you remember the words of John the Baptist when he saw Jesus? He called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That taking away of sin was accomplished by the death of our Lord. Remember the second last saying of Jesus while on the cross? We talked about this on Friday. It is finished. Greek word is tetelestai. It means paid in full. This word was used in the first and second centuries in the sense of fulfilling or paying a debt and often appeared in receipts, paid in full. We still do that today on some invoices, paid in full. It means that once something is paid for, you never have to pay for it again. In fact, paid in full means that once something is paid for, it is foolish to try to pay for it again. You go to the store, you buy all your groceries, you go home and you go back and pay for them again. Or you pay for your car once, ah, I'm going to go back and pay for it again. No, once is enough. You don't go to the restaurant and say, here's the gift card to pay for the meal, and then also pay for it again with your own money. No, it's paid in full with a gift card. <laughs> Let's say at Christmas time, you figure out all the prices of each individual gift you got, and you put a name down, the name of the person, the gift, oh, Canucks jersey from, from Bob, you look it up, it costs $175. So next time you see Bob, you give him $175 in cash. No, it's paid for. You don't pay for the gift. Or you go on an all-inclusive holiday or cruise and then you still pay for all your meals and everything. No, it was paid once. Kind of like going to grandma's house. That was the best all-inclusive I've ever gone to. It included love and food and adoration to all of us grandkids. So she gives you all of her love and food, and then you proceed to write her a check for $500? This is ludicrous. She's saying, I love you. Please do not insult me and pay me for my love. This is the love of Jesus. So I want you under this idea, name your sin. Well, it, it's easy to name it for other people, and other people could probably name your sin. <laughs> so just name, name your struggles. It doesn't matter what your sin is. It doesn't matter how many sins you've piled up in your life. It doesn't matter how guilty you think you are. It doesn't matter you've been doing well this week or poor this week. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how many skeletons are rattling around in your closet. Paid in full. Those sins are taken away. All of your sins have been stamped by God with one word. Tetelestai. Paid in full. Fill in the blank with whatever sins plagued your life. Write them down. Then write over those sins the word tetelestai. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, the price has been paid for your sins. And so if Jesus paid it all, we don't have to. Just like going to grandma's house. We don't pay for all the love and food. If you try to pay for your entrance into heaven to getting into paradise, like that thief said, it means you don't think he paid at all. There's no middle ground between these two propositions. God does not sell salvation. 
you enter into paradise because it's been paid for by Jesus. It's not a salvation at half price. You don't go Dutch treat with God on this one. There's no salvation plan that is an installment plan. Salvation, being delivered from your sins, is free of charge. That's what tetelestai means. Jesus paid in full so you wouldn't have to pay anything. In fact, it's priceless. We can't pay it. It says by grace we're saved. It is a gift of God. A gift. It's personal. Christ died for you. He knows you. Understand that through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Number three, the resurrection shows the new power to live that we can have to be like Jesus. The Bible says His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, lives in you, His Holy Spirit. He is risen, He is no longer dead, and He he sends His Spirit into believers. Philippians 3.10, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. Now, I want to know it and experience what this power is all about now. It's not just about being resurrected into heaven. The resurrected Christ lives in us at conversion. He wants He lives in us. He sits down with us. He reasons with us. He gives us his power, as Paul describes, and we want to know it, experience it. He invites us to sit with him and be personal with him and intimate with him and experience his love and experience his power. This is the kind of power that has compassion for people. It's the kind of power that weeps for people. Because of the resurrection, we become fully operational. We become fully alive in a spiritual way at birth. We are born without a spiritual pulse. And Jesus gives life to our spirit. And he describes it as being born again or a second birth, being born by the spirit. Being a believer in Jesus is not like a hobby or trait you inherit from religious parents. Resurrection people are different and are expected to be different. And it's up to us to understand that invitation of Jesus. So he invites himself into our struggles, our questions, our searches, our longings, our cravings. I know I have a hard time admitting I need help. So might you. I want to be independent. We don't like to ask for help. You know, sometimes we just admit what we used to struggle with and what we used to have a problem with, but we need to look at our life today and say, this is where Jesus wants to guide me. He he wants to shepherd me in this struggle, in this sin that might have me entangled. Jesus was attracted to people who knew, they, who knew they needed their life turned around. He was attracted to sinners, and they were attracted to him. They knew they needed to sit down to talk about their sin and failures and hope to overcome and be done with it, and that's what Jesus did. Jesus says, you are worth dying for. You are an image bearer of the creator of the universe. That's who you are. That's your identity. This is why Jesus is so against classing people and looking at their birthplace, their country of origin, or their color of skin, or their history of sin. This is no way to see people. Everyone is equally made in the image of God. How dare we blaspheme God by declaring some are better than others, some are more important than others, or some are more valuable than others. The death and resurrection of Jesus proves all this. He died for whoever believes. Not a morally elite group who think they deserve it. Because if you think you are of the morally elite group, then you see no need for forgiveness. And the religious leaders were of this belief. He sees you and I as lost, weak, weary, heavy laden, in need of rest, in need of a cup of water for our soul, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus promises a relationship. He said in Revelation 3, Look, here I stand at the door and knock. If you hear me calling, I will come in and we will share a meal as friends. This is a great truth of the gospel right here, the seeking Jesus standing at the door of your heart. God is a seeking God. He has come to seek and to save the lost, to sit down with us. What an invitation. It's a great invitation. Important to understand, this is the evening meal he's inviting us to. And in that culture... Evening meals were for hours. It wasn't just a quick meal of bread dripped in, uh, dipped into some wine. It wasn't the midday meal that was a pack lunch eaten at work, you know, <laughs> bologna sandwich. No, this is an invitation to an evening meal, a lingering all-night affair. The day's work was done, not a hurried meal to get out the door and get back to work. This is connection time. 
This is what Jesus wants with us. He's personal. He does not break into our lives. He must be invited in. And so that's what he wants us to do. Experience his resurrection power. Can you hear Jesus knocking? Let him in. Allow him to change your life. Because of Easter, I need to, and you need to listen to his extravagant claims. His claims make demands about what, am I, what I am to believe about God, what I, I am to believe about myself, my sin, my possibilities, about truth, about reality, about the future, about death, about eternity. This is what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. Jesus entered this world not just to disclose the character of God, but to make it possible for you and I to become like the character of God, to be remade into that likeness. He came to take us from what we are and to make us to what we should be and can be. I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. God will God will guard, protect, and finish what he started. Follow him. Start over again. His mercies are new every morning. He will lead you into paths of righteousness for his namesake. So I hope you see this resurrection life is also about the present. It's now. It's today. It's the beginning of God's new project, and it's not only about taking people away from earth, to go to heaven when they die, but it's to bring his spirit into people's lives and to have the life of heaven here on earth. That, after all, is what the Lord's Prayer is all about. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. Resurrection life starts now. God's plan is not to abandon this world, the world which he said was very good. Rather, he intends to remake it. And when he does, he will raise all his people to new bodily life to live in it. That's the eternity. That's the promise of the Christian gospel. The, re the resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched. It's on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ. And you're invited to belong to it. So don't just think resurrection is for, you know, at the end of your life. It's now. Christ's resurrection doesn't mean escaping from the world. It means having his power come into us and we have a mission to this world. The resurrection gives us a sense of what God wants to do for the whole world. We look at things differently. We look at people differently. We look at, all, we look at our motives and our purpose differently. We are to be an image of Jesus. Resurrection for today. It's about the time before we die. So we need to think of, of a couple things. How does the resurrection of Jesus connect to my actions, my attitudes, my way of thinking, my, re, my reactions, my words, my lifestyle, my problems, my issues, my hangups, my fears, my hopes? The resurrection connects to all of those things. We have been set free from these things to follow Jesus and to love Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What good does it do merely to believe that Jesus was generally raised from the dead? A head type only belief is not enough. The Bible says even the devil believes and he shudders. It's about experiencing Jesus and loving him and worshiping him and, and being and doing all that he wants us to be and do on this earth. It's about now. The resurrection power in our lives makes a difference in our years here on earth. This is what it means to us to affirm and understand the resurrection and live it out on our days on earth. This is what we can do and be because of the resurrection. I can return good for evil instead of evil for evil. I do not have to believe that vengeance is mine. Wow, that's a whole change of attitude. The resurrection says, I will not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. The resurrection means I can turn the other cheek. I can love my enemy. I can let go of a grudge. I can stop fighting to always have things my way. I can think of your interests ahead of my own. That's what the resurrection powerness is about. I can have two coats and give one away. I can persevere under trial just like Jesus did. And when I am tempted, I can find the way out that God has provided. That's resurrection power. I can be quick to listen, slow to speak, 
and slow to become angry. Really? Yes. <laughs> I cannot let any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs. Oh, wow, we all need that. Because of the resurrection, I can choose encouragement over slander in, and insult. I can get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger. That's resurrection power now. I can be kind and compassionate and forgiving just as Christ forgave me. I can be an imitator of God. That's the resurrection. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about Moses having a veil on his face. The veil has been removed. Moses had a veil, but it's now taken away from us. We can see the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, His resurrection, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit ever increasing. I can be like Jesus. I can be set free. This is resurrection life at its pinnacle moment. Set free. Set free to follow Jesus. That's the resurrection. That's the beauty of the new life that we can have. So I hope as we talk about Easter, as you think about Easter, you see it's about resurrection power. Not just so that when you die, you go to heaven. It's now. It's now. Read through the New Testament. Read through the Gospels and see, wow, I can be like this. I can be like Jesus because of his spirit in me, his resurrection power in me. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Our new series coming up after Easter is about this, what it means. And it's entitled, Set Free to Follow Jesus. That's what the resurrection is about. Set free to follow Jesus, to be like him, to love like him, to be like him to all the people in our lives. So happy Easter. Thank you for spending some time with us. Happy Easter and see you next week.